Welcome to Black Health Matters. I'm Daryl Armistead, your host. This episode is a Zoom recording of Howard University group session led by Dr. Clive Callender. <laughs> yeah, this is a, we had talked uh, last week about the uh, Washington Post articles uh, complaining about uh, uh, the uh, fact that uh, the system wasn't working as well as it should and that uh, there needed to be changes made. And so this is uh, an announcement that they uh, now have a, a modernization initiative as well as a new person who's taking over the running of it. Uh, and uh, uh, what will actually happen uh, is, uh, of course, I think one of the most important part of it is the doubling of the uh, amount of money that will be put into the system. Uh, also, there's going to uh, uh, remove the appropriations cap, which uh, is going to be interesting to see what happens with that. And then uh, uh, the stewardship of, uh, of this will be managed by somebody else. Uh, and they announced the person who was going to be over HRSA, uh, uh, who's a person of color, but uh, I think an Asian American. Uh, and uh, of course, this does not address the number one problem of transplantation, which actually is the shortage of donors, a uh, consequence of which uh, 17 people die every single day because of the donor shortage. But it will uh, uh, at least uh, make a face saving effort to say that we've uh, uh, made it a priority and we're going to update everything so that. Uh, uh, so that few organs will be lost that are donated and that uh, the system is working better than it has. And they, they've called us the OBGN modernization website uh, and uh, they'll give progress reports appropriately. Uh, this, this is going to be interesting to see because uh, whoever will be taking over the OBGN, which UNOS has done for the past uh, Yes, it'll be interesting to see how they will really make a difference because that's what really needs to be made. Uh, changes need to be made, but also we still have got to address the number one problem in transplantation, which is the shortage of donors. So it's going to be interesting to see how this all works out. But we had talked previously about the fact that the system had been identified to be uh, uh, to have failed in terms of addressing the needs of the minority population. So uh, this modernization initiative will be interesting to see if it makes a difference because that's really what matters. Any comment or questions about, about this? Whether this is just a face-saving effort or whether it's going to really make a difference, time will tell, and we hope that it will. Uh, but, as, but we also have to emphasize that uh, the donor shortage still is the number one problem. Do a wastage of organs becomes critical, especially when you have a donor shortage. <laughs> no comments? OK. Let's go to the, to the next one then. It's a very, very important, uh, uh, one of a kind announcements that uh, over the count, count of Narcan has been improved, has been approved. And so you can just go to the store and, and get it without a prescription. And this is the uh, nasal spray that uh, will allow people who've been on heroin and, and uh, fentanyl uh, and other drugs to uh, recover. You can find them on the street and just spray some Narcan and uh, they may wake up. So this is uh, 
that you know when you have more than a hundred thousand deaths a year, you know you really got a problem, and it's so much so that uh, I guess everybody should try to get it over the counter, get have it handy, so in case you run across somebody who's out, you just spray it and hope they'll wake up. But uh, <laughs> any comments about this? That's it's just amazing, amazing to me how times have changed and over-the-counter Narcan for opioid addiction is like getting a nasal spray for asthma. Um, it's a common everyday thing. You hear about it every day in the news and it's, it's scary. It really is. Um, it's all around us. The yep, price from... of this is supposed to be pretty high too, I think. That's one thing they don't mention. <laughs> 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 yeah. And Dr. Callender, uh, I mean, I, this Kevin, you know, it's great that they're having such a spray, but I, I, it seems like the fentanyl and other drugs that they're putting in and uh, is evolving to where, you know, it, it, it won't be long before the new the new batch is not, you know, uh, Narcan, Narcan won't touch it because what else they're putting in it now? I mean, they're supposedly cutting it now with uh, like uh, some kind of like a flesh eating, like people are losing limbs because of what they're putting in the, uh, in the heroin and the fentanyl. That's scary. All of it is scary. You're right. They, yeah. they, what you're making is right. It's all scary. Mm -hmm. You know, but and, the thing uh, about what, what is what's even more scary is the thought that uh, uh, that this will will make a difference, uh, because as you mentioned, the the real issue is it's getting into the market, and that is not addressed. Right, because a lot of it's coming in through mail order. Whatever way it's coming in, it's not addressed, and that's the critical aspect of it that you'd want to have have be part of the solution right not only just the the naloxone but also the uh the way in which the drugs enter the country some effort should be made to to addressing that because because that's that's really the problem and uh uh, having this uh, symptom addressed is not enough. It's fifty dollars a dose. Yeah. Good morning. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Who is hey. that? Hi. This is Elizabeth. I'm on my phone because my internet is down. Um, okay. My thoughts on this just brings us back to, am I my brother's keeper? Well, I think to me, it's not only are you your brother's keeper, but are you really addressing the, the issue? Or are you just uh, symptomatically addressing one of the signs of the symptoms of the disease? Uh, so... Having that is, is one part of it, but uh, the fact that uh, uh, we have a drug problem and the, the source of the drug is not being addressed is uh, problematic to me. I've got some comments, but I'm gonna wait until after the recording is done. <laughs> Ah, I understand. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, this is a, an article that talks about the uh, GI drug that uh, people are having with aches and pains and, uh, and talking about uh, something that we may not have discussed recently about the neurovirus and the fact that uh, diarrhea and uh, nausea and vomiting uh, uh, occur. And 
and and then if you if you're not washing your hands and cleaning things, then it will spread widely. And so, this is uh, spiking now, and uh, uh, it's trying to make people aware of it and to remind people once again to, to keep your hands clean as much as possible. Mm. And uh, because the surfaces that people touch when they vomit and they uh, have the diarrhea is infectious. And uh, so uh, we need to be aware of it. I don't know if many of you have encountered people who are having the stomach virus, but, yeah. uh, but if you do, the disinfecting of the uh, surfaces becomes important. And then of course the GI symptoms are the common symptoms that you have when you have gastrointestinal diseases with jump, cramps and pains and headache and uh, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fever, headache as well. So and then of course this dehydration if it's not treated uh, can uh, lead to dire very negative circumstances in which uh, uh, you can faint or die. So uh, it's important to, if you can't take fluids to go somewhere so you can be given fluids so you can be okay. Not as bad as cholera, but it's uh, something that uh, requires uh, treatment and IV fluids. Dr. Callender, yeah. this, this uh, needs uh, physical contact, right? It's not... Yes. Uh, yeah, you have to touch the surfaces or, or the secretions, yeah. It doesn't involve airborne aerosols no. at no. all? No, no. That's why hand washing is so critical and, and also uh, cleaning off the surfaces. Yeah, uh, Clorox and Lysol make a big difference. And this is a very good uh, uh, article because it, it talks about the fact that hand washing beats hand sanitizers, uh, but uh, and hand washing is the piece de resistance and uh, uh, hand sanitizers if you can't do any better is all right but not as important as hand washing then it talks about uh, things to, that you can try to uh, eat while you're, you're recovering uh, when you can't digest the heavy stuff, practice toast, rice, stuff. Good hand hygiene is the real important thing and keeping the surfaces. Uh, and also asking those people when they're sick like that to stay home. Yeah, it's another good thing to do. I'm thinking about the grocery store and the vegetables and fruits. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, if those people touch the food, fruit, yeah, then you would get it. So, yeah. So, so you, you have to wash your, your, your food <laughs> before you cook it? A lot of people do that anyway, but uh, yes, it becomes even more important uh, when you have an, Neurovirus around. Uh, I got a comment about uh, hand washing. Uh, some people think that bar soap is unsanitary, that people leave their germs behind on bar soap and transfer it to other people, and so they prefer to use liquid soap instead. Um, but just an internet search says that bar soap is fine, it's not dirty. It doesn't transfer germs because it's a mechanical action of uh, of washing with water that 
that removes the germs. So for all of you people that prefer liquid soap over bar soap, you just like to spend more money, apparently. <laughs> Thanks for the comment, Darren. Okay. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, let's go to the next one. John. Uh, <laughs> it's an interesting article. We keep talking about exercise for the people who won't do the uh, the uh, 150 minutes a week. A week uh, are we trying to find ways to get those other people to at least do some exercise because some exercise is better than none. Uh, 150 minutes is the target, but uh, uh, because of the number of premature deaths, we want people to at least get some exercise. So we have talked about trying to uh, do 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Uh, and so some walking is better than no walking. I guess that's the bottom line. But that does not take away from the fact that the optimal is still uh, 150. And actually, that's not optimal. That's the smallest amount of exercise you should do per week is 150 minutes. And if you if you do multiples of that, then of course, you're even less likely to have a premature death. Uh, but it's clear that uh, physical activity uh, is becomes critical. I think after the age of 40, uh, exercise is mandatory. Uh, but uh, uh, as you can see, at least uh, 30 to 40 percent of the country uh, does not uh, support that. They they know in principle, but they don't practice it. But, and I guess they emphasize time and time again, a little exercise is better than none. So uh, that's why you have articles like this one and many others that come out and talk about uh, the association of the risk of uh, uh, being lowered with the, with the risk of cardiovascular disease and cancer being lowered by activity. And the more, the better. Dr. Callender, I'm wondering um, how the exercise helps prevent uh, the incidence of cancer. Uh, I'm not sure that we know uh, how. We just know that uh, it does, but uh, I'm not sure we, we exact. But one of the things that they uh, uh, claim is that uh, uh, your cardiovascular health uh, is well known about the, how that, the aerobic exercise help. How it applies to cancer, I'm not sure, but all of the data uh, points out that uh, reduction in cancer rates as well as uh, reduction in cardiovascular deaths. Any other comments relative to yeah, I would think that exercise strengthens, strengthens the uh, the T cells that make you less susceptible to inflammation. Uh, you know, the, and the the outcome of inflammation is cancer. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. It's uh, the data supports that. Uh, yeah, uh, and it supports the fact that uh, all systems that go are made better by uh, physical activity the immune system as well as the brain. Yeah. Oh, this is an article that uh, <laughs> came because uh, Joe Biden said uh, COVID uh, pandemic is over. Well, it is over. It's, an, it's endemic now, but uh, uh, Many people, uh, because of that, stopped uh, uh, wearing masks, uh, social distancing, and other things. And and uh, uh, COVID still is producing infections. I just had one of my medical students who just, uh, was out for COVID. She's better now, but uh, COVID's still with us. It's just that it's not pandemic anymore. It's, more endemic, and because of the vaccines, uh, uh, very few people are hospitalized or die as a consequence, but it's still with us. 
and I think the importance of the vaccination becomes even uh, more dramatic. And there's still uh, some people who are not vaccinated. Nowadays, uh, it's, it's hard to find people who still wear masks, except in the hospital it's still required. And uh, in the, uh, for example, the basketball games, the ushers still wear masks. But, but in terms of other people, I think when I go to the basketball games, uh, I guess I'm the only person I can find other than ushers who wears a mask. So what about the rest of you as you go to, to Concerts. I wear mine. Anybody else wear them or are you alone? Lone uh, Ranger. I wear mine. No, I wear mine too. I wear it all the time. I wear mine yeah. indoors. Yeah, I'm wearing mine at stores. Are you oh, Lone Rangers? And... Yep. Yeah. Sometimes it don't bother <laughs> me though. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, this is Elizabeth again. Uh, yes, I wear my mask and it shows you the percentage. I participated in a 5K race uh, some Saturdays ago. And I looked around and I counted and it was just me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, I looked around and I think there must have been about uh, thousands of people in the uh, basketball game and uh, it's just me and, and the ushers. That was it. That's how it is at the grocery stores now. Rarely do you see someone with a mask. Mm, that's right. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. maybe about 10%. It, yeah. You know, it's, it's very interesting that uh, even before COVID, the Japanese wore masks on a daily basis in, in Japan. And, and Korea, uh, too. Yeah. And you wonder uh, what they saw, what they knew that we didn't know. Uh, at least they accepted it. The people were willing to wear the mask without any, any problem or hesitation. And um, I think it's really you know, held them in good stead in terms of health. And uh, mm -hmm. it's unfortunate that we as uh, Americans can't do that. There's a certain percentage of people that, <laughs> that consider Freedom being uh, free from masks, regardless <laughs> of the source. <laughs> well, you know, it'd be interesting to look at uh, the health of people while they're wearing masks versus the health of people when they're not wearing masks. How many, how few, how much, much fewer colds are uh, do you catch? And uh, yeah, and uh, I don't know if anybody looked at it, but it would be interesting because there's yeah. still, as you mentioned, people who feel that the freedom is is freedom from wearing masks. Uh, United States is one of the few countries in the world that doesn't regulate social media. In Japan, they regulate social media. So you don't have pushback against uh, not wearing masks through social media. And so, you know, if the government says it's a good idea to wear masks, they do it because they don't get the pushback from social media because it was regulated there. Dr. Yeah. Kelly, I have never seen a person who is using a cane or a wheelchair or anything like that without their mask. Yeah, that's an interesting observation. Yeah. That's an interesting observation. Yeah. Dr. Calder, I um I I don't use a mask outside, you know, pretty much, but I, I use it when I, I go in the store. Uh, most of the time, but recently um, I stopped wearing it at when I go bowling, and uh, maybe a third of the people uh, in my league still use a mask, but it's it's less and less. the The manager, the manager of the uh, alley, doesn't use, he hadn't used a mask in months, <laughs> you know, so. Uh, I, I think the, the big deal, like you said, is vaccinations. You know, even even if you get it, you're probably going to be okay because of your if you're vaccinated. My my fear is those folks who 
still refuse to get vaccinated. They think it's a conspiracy. They think, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, the government is trying to do something to them by by way of uh, the vaccination. You know, <laughs> microchips, you know, nano nanobots in your blood. <laughs> and there are people who seriously believe that, you know, therefore they will not get vaccinated. Uh, the best we can do, like Daryl was talking about, give everybody good information as, as best we can uh, to let everybody know that this thing works. Yeah, uh, and it's interesting how they call it COVID fatigue and uh, yeah. um, how it's, 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 it's really overtaken the whole culture as we have, as we have observed. So not much you can do about it except be true to yourself. And if you think you need to wear a mask as I do, wear it. And don't worry about how other people feel about you wearing the mask. And oftentimes in a lot of settings, you feel like the odd man or the freak because you're wearing a mask. And I say this because recently I was in a restaurant and we were leaving, it was about four or five of us. Uh, just so happened, all of us had on a mask. All of us had on a black mask. We were all black. And going out, someone walking in of a different race. Oh, what's going on? Is it a black history thing? or? What's happening? <laughs> I swear. I swear. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, people think, you know, why do you have the mask on? That's over. But for him to say that, and all you can do is just walk away. Just yeah. walk away. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, <laughs> the, uh, the Chinese, a lot of the cities have a lot of pollution. A lot of people, even before, um, COVID had masks on when, when you see them in the big cities with all the pollution. How effective are those masks, I think Daryl might know, uh, with uh, pollution and uh, the, the, the pollen? They're effective. Okay. They are effective. And, that, and that's why in Korea they, they wore the mask because of the pollution. Uh, and they, they, they were effective at the allergies as well, uh, keeping the pollen out. Yeah, you know, a lot of pollen came out uh, around this area early yeah. because of the the warm weather. Yeah, yeah, and that that's the reason why some people wear masks because of the pollen. Interesting. Okay. Well, it's interesting. Uh, now this is an article on dehydration when we talked about. Uh, the uh, uh, neurovirus, and you talked about GI allergies and those kinds of things. That's an issue uh, because it causes dehydration, and dehydration is is not good for anybody. Uh, uh, and that's why we talk about drinking plenty of water. Uh, but uh, especially if you're older, hydration becomes even more important because if you don't have enough water, then you're your kidneys don't work well, and uh, that's not good. So uh, the older you are, the more important it is to be well hydrated. So that's why drinking fluids becomes an important part of the aging process, just as exercise is important for uh, as you age, so is keeping up with your hydration state. And so uh, how do you tell that you're, uh, adequately hydrated, well, uh, your skin, as well as the color of your urine. Uh, so uh, if your urine is dark, uh, dark yellow, uh, then that suggests you need to drink more water. Of course, if your kidneys don't work, then of course it doesn't matter because then you, you don't have dark urine anyway because you can't concentrate. But, uh, uh, and this is a, uh, you see their recommendation for the uh, for men and women who are over 50. 15 cups uh, for men and uh, 10, 11 to 0.5 cups for women. Mm -mm -mm. That's a lot of water. It is, it is. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Probably more than most people think. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the reasons why people over 60 are dehydrated is because um, they have to pee all the time. So they want to cut back on their fluid intake, and so that they don't have, to, so that they don't have to deal with problems like, uh, can I get to the restroom quick enough without having a visible accident? So true. But, so true. Yeah, but then again, you know, it's like, uh, like we always say, there's um, exercise is so wonderful. The more you regularly exercise, exercise, the better likely you are to be able to control your your urinary continence. And uh, then a, a little simple thing like you can get all that water in, just get it all in before 6 p.m. You know, just limit um, the amount that you drink uh, in, in the late evening, and you'll be okay. You can sleep through the night. You won't have um, uh, what's the term for uh, for night pee? Nocturia. Nocturia. You can avoid the nocturia. Yeah. yeah. Good advice. Good advice. Dr. Cowell, this is Sylvia. <clears throat> I remember when my mom had um, surgery and the, um, the person would come here to take her, you know, blood pressure and all, he indicated, now you have real good veins because most seniors don't drink enough water so we can't get to the veins. So I was wondering about water and trying to access veins in the body. Good point. Good point. Because if you're dehydrated, they can't find your veins, which mm -hmm. means they have difficulty sticking you. So the more hydrated you are, the better off you are. And the more yes. easy it is to find your veins. <laughs> okay. Uh, now this is interesting. <laughs> uh, talking about uh, when we come up for our next boosters. Uh, the uh, virus, is, the COVID-19 is going to cost about $150, $130 instead. Uh, and uh, insurance will pay for it, perhaps. Uh, but uh, it's a hefty price, but it's a price that, I guess. Well, I wonder what the pay. price is right now. What's that? What is the price? The going price now. Now it's it's free. Oh, okay. It's free because the government paid for it. Oh, the right. government okay. paid for it. So, Doctor Cowler, what's the price for a flu shot? If if the uh, corona uh, the COVID um, vaccination is going to be one thirty, do you, do you know what the price is for the flu shots that we get every year? Uh, I don't know, but, but I am pretty sure that that's going to be covered. Uh, but it's not going to be excessive. This says that uh, seniors pay seventy dollars per dose for the flu vaccine, but the government pays. You know, the insurance pays for it. We don't see that because our insurance plan covers it. Do you, do you think yeah. the, the cost of insurance is going to go up as a result of that? One hundred and thirty dollars. I don't know. Uh, I really don't have any idea whether or not it will go up. When you say, well, I guess what you mean, will the insurance cover the whole $130? And I, I have no idea. I guess I think Congress may uh, have something to say about that. Now, uh, the government of Costa Rica is going to continue to uh, to fund COVID vaccines, and they have universal health care there. Uh, standard uh, cost of living is about 30% lower than the United States. Um, and they're very welcoming of black people. It's a great place to immigrate. <laughs> well, okay. And they have good internet. <laughs> okay. All right. So anyway, this is an issue that... Uh, is interesting, and then, of course, the the other article talks about we need a second booster. So uh, we haven't they haven't legitimized that yet, but I'm sure it's coming. Mm -hmm. And uh, this then will be a situation 
Uh, how about those people who can't afford the $130? Will the government pay for it again or will the insurance cover it? And that's those are issues that become extremely critical uh, as we talk about the need for a booster for COVID every six months, every year. So we, we say uh, uh, approval may be near. Uh, I think that's uh, likely to occur before the summer because we're now in we're just about April is this weekend. So, so uh, we're getting close to we're close to spring and uh, the summer's sh shortly. And I think before the summer, we'll have approval of the booster. And the question will be. Uh, will Medicare cover that uh, $130? It's likely that they will, but uh, we'll have to wait and see. Uh, Dr. Cowan, I've already had three boosters. And right. Second booster, is this uh, the, that'd be the fourth? Yeah, right. Actually? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Why, why did they say second booster? Is that just for Omicron? Yeah. Okay. Right. Specifically, yeah. Now it's going to be interesting uh, what CDC says about it after they after they approves it because it's likely they will approve it. It's interesting. Only sixteen percent of Americans receive the bivalent booster, which is surprising. And we're getting close to the six month time for that. So those people who are vaccinated are concerned. Those who aren't, they don't care. So it's been interesting over the next couple of months, what happens relative to when they approve the boosters and uh, what the president says about uh, whether government will pay for the booster shots. What they've done in the past. Now, this is a subject of great concern, particularly for uh, African, men, African American men <clears throat> who have more uh, prostate cancer and have, more, have a higher mortality rate with prostate cancer. And so uh, the studies have gone on and on. The question is, what do you do? Do you get radiation treatment, do you get surgery, or do you get nothing? And uh, this is a, a study that they done in, in, in Great Britain. <clears throat> and they found that whether you had radiation therapy or prostatectomy, uh, only 3% of the patients in the study died from prostate cancer. What that means is that uh, at the age you have the prostate cancer, most of the people who die don't die from the prostate cancer. They die from the cardiovascular disease or the other diseases. But they don't actually die from the prostate cancer. So the question is, uh, uh, should you have surgery? Should you have radiation? Or should you have nothing? You know, our chief of urology, uh, operated on people for prostate cancer and gave people radiation, but himself, he developed prostate cancer and took no treatment. And he died from prostate cancer, painful death. But uh, so the question is in the UK, uh, it appears that uh, people who uh, took no therapy, uh, survived as long as those who took therapy. So the question is, uh, in Great Britain, at least, that's what happened. In the United States, uh, I think we have a unique problem that has to be studied, in, not only in the white population, but the, the uh, African-American population, since we have a higher mortality rate and a higher incidence of uh, prostate cancer. And uh, oh, men who, who developed prostate cancer 
at the age of 50 or under uh, are more likely to die from it. So uh, the younger you are, the, the more likely you are to die from a prostate cancer. So, so if you uh, get prostate cancer at 80, that's a different story than if you have prostate cancer at 40. So no, uh, go ahead, Darren. I think using the uh, PSA as a uh, marker in terms of how to treat prostate uh, disease for men is, um, is into some questioning, particularly uh, for, for those over 50. Uh, some uh, believe that the PSA should not even be considered as a, as a marker of uh, prostate cancer because for some reason or other after a certain age, the uh, PSA will, un will automatically go up in men and it's not necessarily related to the severity of the or progression of the cancer. But uh, so as a result, uh, after a certain age, most urologists will not even take a PSA. And I think, I that, be, that, I may... I think that's a mistake because uh, if you have a PSA of three, four, five, or six is one thing. But if you have a PSA of, of 30, 40, 50, then that's another. And uh, I think that is, is particularly important for people for people of color, because uh, if you have a PSA that's in the 30s and 40s, that's more likely to be associated with malignancy. And that does require uh, treatment, whether, whether it's uh, radiation or hormonal or, or whatever, uh, because if it's really prostate cancer, then it's different. So that, I, and, and I, I still think that, the, and that, that's why the different schools of thought uh, uh, there, for example, in the uh, uh, many white doctors don't do PSAs either. Uh, but I think for the African American population, I think that becomes uh, an issue that is still discussed uh, about whether or not uh, it should be used. Uh, I think most of the, the African American neurologists believe that uh, uh, the PSA should be done. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but there's a lot of controversy, uh, not only because of, of uh, the fact that the PSA is elevated, but the biopsies and other uh, things that follow that uh, have sometimes caused more problems than uh, uh, the prostate disease itself. But anyway, this is a subject of much discussion. And uh, in this country, it's different from in, in, in the UK. Uh, this has been uh, the source of much urological discussion. Yeah. In, 2003, in 2003, my PSA was 1.5, and I was concerned because my father had prostate cancer. Uh, so the same year, I started eating a vegan diet, and my PSA is currently 0.8. And so, you know, I'm getting older, but my PSA is going down. I'm reading um, on the Internet from the AMA. It says the AMA notes that black Americans are at particularly high risk for prostate cancer, colorectal cancer, and cardiovascular mortality. And prostate and colorectal cancer are strongly linked to dairy, processed meat, and red meat consumption. Excellent. Very good. Okay. Dr. Callender, this is Sylvia. You mentioned regarding prostate cancer, either surgery or I guess uh, chemo. Now, I, my husband, I think, had a, a prostate problem there, and he's taken a pill, Tam right. Solosin, every day. Right, there's hormonal treatment, that's correct. That's the third treatment, hormonal treatment. Oh, okay. So yeah, she and indicated, some, the doctor said he'll be taking this for the rest of his life. Yeah, well, for some people, the hormonal treatment uh, is, is the treatment of choice. It depends on what stage of prostate cancer is found. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I have some, some patients who are on hormonal therapy alone. Um, now, hormonal, it's, it's, hormonal means what, Dr. Calder? Oh, it means pills. Just pills, okay. Yeah, just like your husband. Yeah, okay. when I say hormonal therapy, they mean pills. Okay. Uh, in contradistinction to the surgery or uh, chemotherapy. 
Okay. <clears throat> she was questioning what is hormonal, and hormonal is the, the the medications are to depress the testosterone that is generated in the male. Oh. And that's the purpose to eliminate the uh, male hormone. That's uh, testosterone. So you you're essentially taking estrogen or something lower. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. I had a question, Dr. Callender, about um, uh, metastasis. If you develop prostate cancer and don't treat it, what's the um, incidence of metastasis? Well, as this article says, about 30% of the people, by the time they have the diagnosis, have metastasis. And those are the people who often... Uh, will have hormonal therapy alone uh, uh, because uh, surgery at that point uh, uh, may not be appropriate. So uh, if you've got spread already, then the treatment is likely to be hormonal or medication rather than the other two types of treatment. Most, more often than not, the surgery is associated with curative uh, expecting for cure as is radiation, uh, whereas the uh, medication or the pill or the uh, hormonal therapy is, is uh, uh, as, as Dr. Ivey mentioned, is uh, more appropriate to uh, uh, suppress uh, the testosterone and, and actually, uh, yeah, to suppress the testosterone. By the way, Dr. Callender, uh, this is not a hereditary disease, is that correct? Well, uh, let's put it this way. If you're a man, you're gonna get prostate hypertrophy or prostate cancer. So, you know, so it goes with being a man. Testosterone is, is maybe associated with it, but so, so, when, so if you're a man, you're gonna get it. Now, uh, if you live long enough, you're gonna get it, so. Uh, they're very rare people who, who get out of this life without having prostatic problems with one sort or another. Dr. Uh, Kemper, some... if, you, if you're on chemo, does that mean that the cancer is advanced? Is chemo the option for more advanced um, prostate cancer? Well, you said chemo. I don't know what you mean by chemo, but a hormonal therapy is more likely for the uh, aggressive and spread metastatic uh, prostate cancer. Okay. So that, I, have, I, don't, I don't know what you yeah. mean. Right. I have a friend who um, was diagnosed with prostate cancer and um, they said it was advanced, but they said the option was not to do surgery and he's right. having chemo every day. And he's having chemo yeah. every day for seven weeks or something like that. Okay, all right. I, I don't know when they say chemo, what, what they mean by that, because uh, yes, they, that is another option, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a less common option than the hormonal therapy. So, and I, <laughs> I don't know whether, whether when they say chemotherapy, they referring to the hormonal therapy or whether they meant specific uh, uh, anti uh, prostate cancer treatment that's uh, uh, actually uh, chemotherapy. Right, because the hormonal is a pill, which I would think he could just take that at home. But he's yes, going, that's right. Yeah, but he's going out to have chemo each day. Okay, all right, all right. So that's separate. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Callender, it sounds like according to that schedule that she shared on this guy. It sounds like that would be radiation. No, but, but she said, well, is it getting, yeah, is, he's going well, to, is he going to get- uh, Maybe IV that's treatment? it, it's radiation. He oh. goes out every day for radiation, that's it, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. Oh, okay, oh, okay. okay. All right, yeah, so radiation. So that means it's advanced? Well, no, no, well, if they find, for example, I have a friend who has prostate cancer who had, uh, surgery and because it was spread, uh, he had uh, radiation as well. Mm -hmm. And then in addition, after it recurred, he also then had 
hormonal therapy. So it uh, so so yes, we use those therapies when the cancer is not only in the prostate. If it's only in the prostate, then surgery is often thought of as a treatment of choice or radiation. Sometimes people would prefer radiation because you don't get the uh, effect upon your ability to have erections. Uh, and, and so they opt to have radiation because of that, because sometimes uh, uh, prostatic surgery is associated with uh, uh, inability to have erections thereafter. Right. And so they will prefer to have radiation in that case. So, and that can be used uh, uh, whether you have localized prostatic cancer or uh, spread uh, prostatic cancer. Okay, thank you. It's just that with, uh, if you have spread, they use, usually utilize radiotherapy and uh, hormonal therapy. Dr. Callender, uh, I, like Daryl, um, was concerned about the um, uh, genetic uh, predisposition uh, for prostate cancer. Both my father and my son had prostate cancer. My, my son was only 48, I think, when he uh, got it. My father was in his seventies. He was younger than I am now. Uh, when when he got it, um, he had that uh, the, the the implant the radioactive bead. bead. That's right. Thank you. Yeah, and and he he survived uh, with actually no uh, no ill effects as far as I can tell. And my my son had cryosurgery so um and he was cancer free after that as well but i i definitely uh have had to ask my physician for the psa uh test because because of that you know i'm you know <clears throat> and i'm also on the tamulosa as well so i didn't know that was hormonal therapy no tamulosa is not Oh. That's different. Okay. Hemorrhosin is for benign prostatic hypertrophy because it uh, decreases the, the prostatic swelling and allows you to have to urinate and, and, and decreases the likelihood of bacteria. So it's a little different, yeah. Okay. Well, but, so but anyway, your, your concern about the, the genetic aspect of prostatic cancer is, is appropriate. And uh, so... Uh, yeah. Thank you. Daryl, you have your hand up? Uh, yes. 80% of African Americans are lactose intolerant compared to 20% of Caucasians. And from Loma Linda University and National Institute of Health say that men with higher intakes of dairy foods, especially milk, face a significantly higher risk of prostate cancer compared to men with lower intakes of dairy food. Does that include cheese? Yes. Uh, cheese is, uh, it does include cheese. Cheese is not as inflammatory as milk, but it does include cheese. Dr. Atto, you have your hand up. Yes, uh, good morning, everybody. Yes, I'm very concerned with uh, Mr. Buchanan's uh, question on uh, this prostate uh, cancer. He said that his father had it and then his son had it also, but uh, in, uh, he is not affected. So my question to him, or to anybody there, could that, in his generation, in his in <clears throat> in his own case, could that be a skip in the generation, the skipping of that gene in his generation? I can't answer that question, so I don't I don't know the answer to that question. <clears throat> Any other comments about this? Because this is, of course, the men, uh, 
particularly concerned about is because this is a disease that affects 98% of men, either BPH or prostatic cancer. Dr. Calendar, um, my father had prostate cancer when he was like 65 and he was treated and cured, but it came back at 93 and that's what killed him. Mm -mm. Okay. All right. How so was it treated? If you have it and it's treated, he was treated with the beads. Oh, when, okay. And uh, when he was 93, well, when he was 90, he had uh, colon rectal cancer, which was cured. And he mm -hmm. was coming up on the, uh, on the four year anniversary of that. And uh, the prostate cancer came back and that's what mm -hmm. killed him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, was, that's the one thing that women don't have to worry about. <laughs> yeah, that's one thing. Yeah, of course, you have a, ovarian yeah. cancer. Yeah. <laughs> you have ovarian cancer and uterine um, cancer. But, uh, yeah, breast cancer. And breast cancer, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Men, men also have breast cancer, but it's very, very, very seldom. <laughs> that's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, that's a very interesting discussion. Yeah, this is the case that Dr. Atto. Oh, yeah. Us. Remember you told us about this? Yeah. Yeah, and this, uh, mm -hmm. and shortly thereafter, we, we, we got this in the newspaper that uh, okay. exactly as you had mentioned. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah, exactly as you had mentioned. And uh, so uh, that's an interesting story. Did you want to? Because you actually, you told us exactly what had happened before. You want to tell us again, uh, Dr. Atto? Yes. Uh, the man has been found guilty himself, the wife, and uh, the Nigerian doctor uh, in London, who is uh, a cousin of his. Three of them have been found guilty last week by the, uh, by the UK court. So he will be sentenced in uh, on May, May fifth. Mm -hmm. So most Nigerians, almost ninety percent of Nigerians, are happy that the case. Really? Is, yeah, is being is being tried in London or in UK, rather rather than in Nigeria, because if the case were being tried in Nigeria, the man will go scot free. Even the victim will be penalized for speaking out. So mm. everybody is very, you know, except his relatives, but everybody is very happy that uh, the law caught up with him. You know, politicians in Africa, per se, you know, they will, they will, they will, they, they will a lot of influence and money. And they can buy anything, their freedom with money regardless of whatever crime they commit. So we are very happy about that. <clears throat> life sentence, that, that's what is kind of is interesting, a life yes. sentence. Yes, that is on the high end. And yeah. on the lower end, he might get about, I think 11 to 15 years. And I remember he, he, is still, uh, he still has his position as a senator. In uh, in Nigeria, you know, the senators make more money than the senators in America. You know, and this man has more than forty mansions scattered all over the world, in the uh, UK, in Nigeria, in America. He has houses everywhere. Where did he get the money from? You know, stealing the government money. So. Yeah. Uh, now, five minutes in jail is, is enough to frighten anybody. But <laughs> there's this guy who's going to have a, a be in jail in the UK. Uh, is, is that where he is now? Yes, that's, yeah. He has been there for nearly one year now. He has been in custody. So he wow. will not, yes, yes. Wow. Yeah, this is a frightening story because you're right. If it if this took place in Nigeria, it would be no big no big thing. Exactly. Yeah. But uh, wow. Hmm. 
my goodness. It, it's, but you know, here's the here's the thing. It all depends on what country you do things in. Yes. Because in some some countries, uh, this is legal. Uh, and he, he picked the one country uh, where he he made a big mistake going exactly. to exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And, and he okay. If see the victim, he promised the victim uh, fifteen hundred pounds, one thousand five hundred pounds. And then when they got to London and they found out that the victim's donor was not a match to his, his daughter's uh, kidney. You know, he could have simply paid the guy the money. Right. You know. So, right. So, <laughs> you know, pennywise pound foolish. Yes. Know? Yes. He decided mm. to rather send the boy back to Nigeria to continue suffering because of fifteen hundred pounds, which is nothing to him. Which is nothing to him exactly. Yeah. It's a sad story, but I suspect that it goes on in other countries. Uh, mm. And uh, without any consequence. Exactly, exactly. Wow. It's, it's hard to imagine that uh, somebody actually got caught for this because uh, uh, this is what people fear is happening every day in countries outside of the uh, UK and the United States. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. Dr. Dr. Why, yes. why did he go to the UK as opposed to another country? Yes, he went he to the UK a... because he had his money there. That's probably exactly, true. exactly. A lot of the people from Africa hide their money in exactly. the UK. Exactly. Mm. Okay. Mm. Well, kind of sad, very sad story. Yeah, it's very sad. Yeah, this is uh, another uh, issue about people trying to live forever, and that's something that uh, is uh, true everywhere. Uh, in, in the United States, we do transplants to try to live forever. Uh, but what amazes me is the number of, of practices that uh, people are involved with in an effort to uh, uh, live forever. I, I thought of of Daryl in a sense, because one of the big things they talk about are these ice baths. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, uh, Daryl has talked a long time ago about, about how healthy uh, ice baths are, and they are. Uh, but uh, and I was amazed at some of the other things they're doing to stave off uh, death, which is inevitable. Anyway, but uh, uh, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and uh, so this is the first thing they talk about is the cryotherapy. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's clear though that, uh, you know, if you have somebody who is uh, drowning or in, in the ice, uh, that uh, the ability to recover is much greater. And, and actually when you have people who have cardiac arrests, one of the things they do is put you under cryotherapy uh, which is a, which allows uh, many people to recover, so that uh, uh, the, the ice cold baths are something that uh, uh, the uh, meek and mild, unlike uh, Daryl, are unable to to endure. Any of you uh, take cold baths uh, like Daryl? No, indeed. No. <laughs> No way, Jose. No way. way. No way. Daryl, any comment? <laughs> no way. Yeah. Uh, some of y'all need to man up or woman up. And, <laughs> you know, if you just if you don't have the cojones to do the right thing, yeah. uh, I'll, I'll be. <laughs> they call it cryotherapy for a reason because I once that cold hit you, yes, you're gonna cryo on your therapy, all right. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. Those of you who want to man up, man up. <laughs> or woman up. 
<laughs> no, okay, I'm I'm going back to our roots because our roots aren't as comfortable as they are today. You know, it used to be uh, back in the day when we had that River Jordan. That River mm -hmm. Jordan, I'm Jordan. The River Jordan mm -hmm. was uh, not necessary. It was it was a cold bath when you jumped into the river. <laughs> yeah. so, you know, back in the back in the day, it wasn't no thing. We just we just did it and went on with it and, and, and lived to 110, 120 yeah. years back <laughs> in the day. <laughs> oh God, I'm messy. But, but now, but now y'all want to be so comfortable all the time. I need my hot shower. I can't do no cold shower. I can't do no ice bath. And look at you. You're all sick and feeble. And, you know, it's, it, y'all better man up or woman up. Just saying. Just saying. We hear you down. We hear you. Happy birthday, Daryl. Now, this is another thing that Daryl has talked about as well. That is fasting. Intermittent fasting. Uh, and that... Uh, there are those who, who fast, uh, take one meal a day or one meal every weekend and those kinds of things. So that intermittent fasting, I think, Dow, you talked about that as well, right? Yeah, and it's a, it's a lot easier. All you got to do, it, okay, there's an old saying that said, it wouldn't kill you to miss a meal. That's all you got to do. Just a day a week, just miss a meal and you've done your intermittent fasting. Okay. All right. So that's two that's two for Daryl and zero for us. <laughs> doctor, doctor, how about if you have uh I mean I used to do intermittent fasting, but you know, with uh with my liver disease, they 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 advocate more meals. You know, so I don't think there's no uh I'm not going sixteen hours without a meal, you know, and that's that's my doctor's orders. Well, that I think he he was not uh, uh, addressing somebody who has a liver disease, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, right, you got to do what your doctor tell you for your right. liver disease. Right. Right. What about this red light therapy? I, I'm not. Uh, uh, they use special lasers to expose the body to red light, and this suggests that this may re re increase production of the important compounds that stores energy for the cells. And uh, this is another uh, quest uh, for longevity. Um, so anybody done any of this red lighting? No. No. You think that's why they have red light districts in certain parts? <laughs> <laughs> I I touch that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wants to be a, be a comedian. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that, that, that's just, uh, uh, those are some of the things that people do to, to uh, live forever. And, uh, of course, what is the oldest age that people have lived to? There's somebody who was 100 and... Uh, 120? Yes, yes, 120. Yeah. Of course, in the old days, remember, uh, Methuselah lived to be 969, but uh, I'm not sure what kind of calendars they were using those days. Yeah. Uh, now, do you have any idea if the 969 is uh, equivalent to the calendar years that we use today? You're muted, Daryl. Daryl, you're muted. You can't hear me. Oh, okay, you can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Can. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, that uh, count for Methuselah it wasn't in solar years. Um, so let's see. Uh, let's see. I, I actually used the uh, calculated the count that they used back uh, during the time uh, for Adam and Methuselah. And uh, Adam actually lived for 130,000 years, solar years, according to the count that we use today. Oh. How many years? 130,000 years. <laughs> My take on it is the calendars were different back then than oh, they, they were. And yeah. the other thing is that there's no way that we can determine how long a minute was, you know, 
centuries ago and what the minute is now, if, you know, if it was changed, we wouldn't know. We wouldn't know. Uh, not exactly true because uh, with, uh, with astrophysics, they can determine that the length of a solar year, they can determine what it was 200,000 years ago as compared to, the, to today. And it's only fractions of a second different uh, now than it, than it was today, yes. So they, they uh, scientifically can determine the length of a year and it hasn't, the length of a solar year has, uh, uh, hasn't really changed. The, the change is very slight it's only fractions of a second different now than it was 200,000 years ago. And that's exactly how long Homo sapiens sapiens have been on the planet, 200,000 years. Yeah, I don't go with those theories because there's no <laughs> it's way. It's not a theory. It's, yeah, uh, it's factual. Uh, there's no <laughs> fact that you've ever shown me. It showed me how uh, a solar year, you know, thousands of years ago is the same as today. It's just like the story in the Bible when God stopped time. You know, we would never know. We would never know. Yeah. Okay, that's an argument that will persist. Uh, but uh, uh, as of today, the, the, the people who live, we talk about 120 as being among the oldest living people. <clears throat> NMN, I'm not familiar with that, but uh, uh, it's a uh, supplement that uh, uh, increases the body's levels of critical enzymes. And I'm not familiar with anybody who has uh, taken that supplement. Mm -hmm. uh, anybody on the online? It, it uh, this is, what is the name of the supplement? Uh, it's it's called uh, nicotinamine riboside and vitamin B3. No, it I haven't heard of it. Yeah, I haven't heard of it. But anyway, it's that's another supplement that is used. But it's interesting that many things that uh, is included in this article. Uh, and then, of course, this is something I wondered if Dr. Atu knew, knew anything about, although it was, it's an Indian herb uh, that, that they use, uh, ashwagandha, is a root of, of powder that they use in India. So uh, I'm not familiar with that as well, but that is, uh, it's thought as a promising agent. Uh, they actually have uh, found that the shortened telomeres are lengthened as a consequence of, of this uh, product. Uh, so, anyway, these are just some of the things that people are using. Metformin is a, a drug that uh, they use for diabetes, and it's uh, thought to delay the onset of age-related diseases, in addition to being therapy for diabetes. Uh, so that, uh, and then, of course, other hormonal therapies, uh, estrogen, testosterone, uh, have been used to uh, uh, try to promote uh, uh, longevity as well. Uh, but when push comes to sub, everybody that is born dies. So mm -hmm. in spite of all of these uh, efforts, rapamycin is a drug that is used for transplantation uh, that uh, slows down cellular growth and is thought that this could also, uh, in addition to acceptance, causing graft acceptance, uh, also it's got to help find the fountain of youth, which we've not found. Yeah. Ashwagandha okay, I mean, sells, on, uh, sells on Amazon for uh, from $9 to $20 uh, for ashwagandha capsules, in case anybody's interested. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's go to, the, is that the last one, uh, John? Oh, this, oh yeah. One more after. Yeah, okay, this is a, a subject that, uh, subject that is uh, sad. 
you can see that uh, uh, physicians take more lives than any other profession, which is uh, shocking. One doctor dies by suicide every day. Mm. Uh, 9% of male physicians, 11% of female physicians said they had thoughts about many killing themselves. And the question is why? And I think one of the one of the things may well be that they may think that doctors uh, uh, really have the key to life. We don't. Uh, we do the best we can to save lives, fail often, but also, but succeed sometimes. Uh, so, but when you know that you don't have the power of life and death, uh, it's, uh, it's it's less likely to be associated with suicide. Uh, and this talks about uh, some of the mindsets that some physicians have that uh, uh, suggest that they don't have the flexibility that allows them to deal with the ups and downs. As you know, there are physicians who because of COVID and the inability to save lives and committed suicide. Uh, And, and it's interesting that this coach says that silence and isolation are the real problems. And uh, not working in isolation is part of it. Was this associated with any uh, particular medical specialty? Uh, it's interesting because uh, as, as I recall, anesthesia, anesthesiology is one of the areas uh, that had the highest suicide rate. And I believe uh, psychiatry was another one as well. Mm -hmm. uh, this article didn't uh, identify the areas in medicine that were the highest, but uh, those were two of the areas that were, those, those uh, areas that had close association with medications. Uh, like anesthesia and uh, psychiatry were uh, among those. And I'm looking at something. Yes. Looking at something called 10 Facts About Physician Suicide. And it says uh, dry, burnout is a big cause. Drivers include workload, work inefficiency, lack of autonomy, meaning in work and work home conflict, and that doctors are less likely than the general population to get help for mental, mental health treatment. Right, and the other thing is if you get help, uh, will that be used against you? And so therefore, oh. they, some people don't get help. But uh, the stigma is still an uh, issue. Uh, it's interesting. Maybe that physician suicides I've, I've 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 known of were actually not related to the practice of medicine, but were related to factors that were associated outside of the practice of medicine, uh, like uh, uh, infidelity and other things like that, uh, and of course depression. Depression was one of the other factors that was associated with them. suicide, especially those who did not take medications for the depression. Yeah, I'm reading 28% of residents experience major depressive episode during training versus 7 to 8% of similarly aged individuals in the general population. Um, is it... I'm thinking that uh, if your primary care doctor or any of your treating doctors don't appear to be happy, maybe it's a good idea to switch to somebody else who's happier. I'm thinking you can get better treatment from a happy doctor than you can uh, an unhappy one. <laughs> Makes sense. I don't know. Never, never, never seen data on that, but uh, I think that. Well, they, I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know. I, 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 some. For example, my wife went to a doctor and all she talked about was her unhappiness. So some of the doctors, <laughs> they talk about their personal lives yeah, and yeah. They, they let you know that they're unhappy. Uh, so that, that's how you can know if they 
Yeah, you know, and 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 of course, uh, uh, burnout is is means that you're unhappy, uh, and so, uh, and that that's why it, you know, I guess the the bottom line is, are you really working? Uh, are you uh, enjoying what you're doing? Uh, um, and uh, and that, that make that 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 demonstrates uh, whether you're happy or not, whether you enjoy what you're doing, and uh, if if it's fulfilling, uh, and if it's not fulfilling, and then you're more likely to be burned out and, and more easily be associated with the depression. But of course, the other thing is uh, when you realize that uh, uh, the physicians. Uh, really do the best they can to uh, uh, keep you healthy, but uh, we don't have the power of life and death. And the sooner you realize that, the better off you are. Now, any you've always uh, mentioned to me about the doctors who have uh, a series of surgery death on their record. Have a series of what? Uh, Patients who have died under their surgical hand, you know, they get depressed and they get, they do suicide sometimes. Well, some, you know, for example, there's some specialties that are associated with uh, uh, neurosurgery, uh, some other specialties, cardiac surgery, and then transplant surgery, which are associated with, with uh, uh, deaths. But uh, and, and again, it depends upon whether you real, recognize or think that death is a consequence of what you did or whether death is a consequence of, uh, of a natural process. Uh, and a lot of that uh, uh, is impactful. Lou, what do you think? Well, I think that um, happiness has a, a role in everything in everybody's life. Those who tend to be um, happier as opposed to being depressed tend to be more suicidal. I think uh, for, for those of us that have spent our time in the operating room and have operated on a lot of patients, I, I think um, it can be depressing if you are unsuccessful. I know in cardiac surgery, since this is a relatively new field, when I started, it was about 50 years old. And of course the referrals for surgery at that time were at the very end of the cardiac uh, medical care. So when the cardiologist could do no more, they would refer them to the cardiac surgeon. So our mortality rate was very high because the patients that we received were at the end of their cardiac um, Right. resuscitation ability. I mean, the muscle had been so destroyed that there was nothing you could do. So it was very high risk surgery. So a lot of the cardiac surgeons that I know got depressed, but I don't know any of them that had committed suicide. The, uh, the only ones that I know in medicine that have been particularly suicidal are the students. I have encountered several medical students who have taken their own lives. But um, I, I don't, I have not seen surgeons depressed to the point of suicide because of uh, lack of uh, success in the, uh, in the operating theater. It's interesting that you mentioned that, Lou, because as a transplant surgeon, when I first started out, the mortality rate was around 50%. Mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty high. And, uh, 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 but uh, the recognition that uh, you're doing the best you could uh, uh, was uh, sufficient for most of us. And I didn't know any transplants. Right, and, and your enthusiasm and, and enjoying what you were doing was a driving factor to keep you trying yeah. to do the best you can. That's right, right. Rather yeah. than making you depressed. Absolutely. So, so th these are all of the thought processes that go into it. Uh, but uh, there are some people who come into it depressed already. Yeah. And so, 
and that that is probably the group that is associated with the higher rates of uh, depression. Yeah, I mean higher rates well, of suicide. Well, and now, yeah, one end of the range we got. One end of the range, we got suicide and depression. And then on the far side, we got happy. And so I'm really focusing on happy. Make sure that you have happy doctors. And somebody <laughs> asked, how can you tell if your doctor is happy? You know, just after a few words of conversation, whether right. or not you got a happy doctor. <laughs> and if you don't, kick them to the curb. Get somebody like Dr. Callender. You know that he's a happy doctor. You. you could go around this panel, and you know exactly who on this panel is happy, who's just <laughs> medium, who needs to get happier, who's a little sad. You know that. And you're your heart of hearts, and you are absolutely right. There you know are I am, you know that I'm happy. <laughs> well, you know, you know that comes with bedside manner too. A doctor yeah. has that has a smile yeah. on his face. The one yeah. that you can relate to or feel comfortable with. That's the doctor you want to be with. If it's someone's always frowning and looking at the dark side of telling you, well, you got ten days to live, and that's not a good idea. You know, it's. I would switch over as soon as possible. <laughs> I agree. You go to a doctor to feel better. You're talking about cardiologists and court. Any doctor, any doctor, you're only yeah. as good as your doctor. I think it's important to develop that relationship with your doctor. If you trust him, you trust him. Almost anything he says is going to make you feel better. Um, not long ago, I felt like I needed to talk to someone. And I found a doctor that I had been talking to on um, a monthly basis. And I thought we were having a good rapport. And then a couple of meetings, um, I just felt like he was distant. So I called him out on it. I said, I don't think you're listening to me. Um, you're not responding the way you once did. And he apologized. You're right. I'm going through something. And um, it's kind of personal, but it came out. So what did that mean to me? Thank you. It was good, but we'll just take a break. <laughs> and you have to do that. You have to have that, that gut feel. You have to have it. Calendar, yeah. you have it. I trust you. Uh, <laughs> when you go to a doctor like Dr. Calendar, Daryl, you're right. You want to come out. And sometimes it's not what you say, but how you say it. You have to give your patient that comfort level. And this was a good doctor, but if he's going through something and it's coming out visibly or in his words, his emotions, facial expressions, how can you help that person? So it's important to listen to your doctors and develop that relationship and that confidence in your doctor. That was a wonderful thing you did for your doctor. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. honest with him and he was honest with me and I liked him initially but I can tell something was off mm -hmm. I knew I was off but I didn't want him to be off <laughs> and, uh, he was off <laughs> uh, well you know, you know another thing is that uh, doctors are never supposed to get sick they're not supposed to die and they're not supposed to be uh, uh, ill-tempered and that's the way the patient looks upon them and that's what they expect Exactly. But the doctors are human too. Exactly. And exactly. they do have problems. Some are able to uh, yes. to shield it more so than others. Yes. Mm. Uh, it, it, it takes a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, doctors don't necessarily pick their patients. Mm -hmm. And doctors treat everybody, whoever shows up, uh, regardless of their mood, because their mood can also affect the doctor's mood to yes, some sure. degree. So it's it's a human relationship uh, yeah. situation. Dr. Callender, that that doctor you were talking about that uh, uh, died from the illness that he treated. Do you think that was a form of suicide? <laughs> no, I'm not understanding you. You have you talked about a doctor that uh, had an illness that he treated and he didn't treat himself. Talking about urologist. Urologist. No, I, I was talking about a doctor who had uh, uh, prostate cancer. Oh, oh, that, that, oh, that one. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And what was your comment about him? I was wondering if that was a a, a form of suicide. 
Not yeah, really. I, no, it, it go, goes back to the the uh, conversation we had about how do you treat prostate cancer? And uh, one of the ways of treating pro prostate cancer is to do nothing. And so he adopted that process. He, he wasn't suicidal. He just uh, felt he uh, at that time was watch and wait. Uh, there were some people who treated prostate cancer by surgery, by radiation, and the third ones by not doing anything. And so I didn't think it was suicide. I thought it was just uh, the fact that he decided to. Uh, he shouldn't if... have been treating himself. <laughs> well, OK, yeah, I guess. Uh, although, yeah, he wasn't he didn't do anything. So uh, when you say treating yourself, you're usually doing something. He did absolutely nothing. Right. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I guess you could take it that way. I didn't see it as suicide, but that's an interesting take on that. <laughs> well, we've got a lot of interesting uh, discussions today. Hey, Carol is here. How about that? Welcome, Carol. Uh, we missed you, and uh, we didn't miss you as much as John missed you. Yeah! <laughs>